Okay. So before introducing our last keynote speaker, uh, I'm pleased to inform you that uh, member of the European Parliament, Mrs. Gutierrez Cortines, has just arrived. She's uh, here with us to listen to the results of our... Uh, <laughs> She's, so she's here with us to listen to the last outcomes of this uh, of today. Uh, it's very it's a big honor for us and a big chance because uh, Mrs. Gutierrez Cortines has been the only member of Parliament of the European Parliament to defend for the last 14 years cultural heritage in the agenda of the European Parliament. So George has asked us to uh, dream for the last two days and with uh, our member of European Parliament we're going to go back to the earth tomorrow and try to see how we can influence uh, policy makers and what, how can we change things. So we're very happy to have her. And now I would like to uh, introduce our last speaker, sorry. Uh, as Alison mentioned to you uh, on the first day, with the partners, who I want to thank again for, for helping us to organize this, uh, this forum, with the partners, we wanted to invite keynote speakers every day from outside our field. And so was Lydia that uh, came on the first day and gave us a picture of the broader, the challenges of the broader world of science. And also so was Joan who today told us about sustainability and those wider societal priorities that we have to address. And our third and last keynote speaker is much closer to our field. Dr. Lynn Meskel is from Australia, but she lives in America where she's a professor of anthropology and the director of the Stanford Archaeological Center. For a few years now, she has been studying and following up the World Heritage issues and specifically the World Heritage Committee and its decision-making process. This morning, we've seen striking illustration of how the planet is under pressure. Dr. Lynn Meskel will take us back to cultural heritage and through the example of World Heritage, she will illustrate some of the growing pressures which are threatening the long-term conservation of its assets. She will also give us an example of how an integrated approach of science and conservation can bring positive outputs. The World Heritage is a very specific example. Nevertheless, the broader issues concern all types of heritage. As we heard this morning, everything is connected. So it's my great pleasure now to invite Dr. Lynn Meskel to talk to us. So I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers and also the participants of this very impressive international workshop. It's an honor to be invited to speak with such an array of experts in the global field of conservation science. My talk today is really a talk of two halves, and these two aspects really reflect my research interests as an archaeologist concerned with the status of cultural heritage sites today, specifically those designated World Heritage Archaeological Sites. All this ha is also has a broader uh, implication for conservation science. As an archaeologist, I've worked at two World Heritage Sites. One is Chattel Hyuk in Turkey that I'll speak about in greater detail later, and another uh, in South Africa, Mapungupwe. Um, but in the first part of the paper, I want to outline some of my uh, recent, more ethnographic work on the 1972 convention and the role of World Heritage uh, Committee in defining the stakes for conservation today. Over the past three years, I've researched UNESCO at its headquarters, been an official observer at the annual World Heritage Sessions in Paris, St. Petersburg, and Cambodia. As an archaeologist and not simply an observer at these meetings, one cannot help but consider the future of almost a thousand sites on that list, especially in the face of increasing infrastructural development, large-scale extraction and exploitation, and the impacts of climate change. Today, I'm going to suggest that as the rush for inscribing more and more sites on the World Heritage List increases, 
the resources, concerns and commitments for conservation of sites already on the list may actually be declining. And as you are all aware, UNESCO uh, is an intergovernmental agency and part of the UN family. State parties that are signatories to the convention are the most powerful decision makers in world heritage. It's not people like us. Um, and they are the, particularly those countries that have representation on the committee. These states' parties with World Heritage Sites have the potential to attract international prestige uh, and national, of course. They have access to the World Heritage Fund for monetary assistance and can tap the potential benefits of heightened public awareness, tourism, and economic development. And I show a picture here of Machu Picchu. Now, these state benefits, however, can sometimes trump other concerns over the materiality of heritage, its protection, or the living communities who have most to win or lose in this scramble for world heritage. These are the two sites here I mentioned earlier that I've worked at, uh, all of which have uh, very much invested local communities. But from a positive perspective, the impact of the 1972 Convention has grown over time, inspiring greater involvement by governments, communities and individuals, as well as universities, foundations and of course the private sector. However, we are witnessing, I think, in the recent committee sessions, uh, this rush to inscribe, which is becoming a political tool for nations to bolster their sovereign interests. Yet the notion of collective responsibility, both ethical and fiscal, once so central to the ideals of the Convention, is increasingly under threat. But perhaps this is not new. Since the first international campaigns to Nubia in the 1960s, followed by Mohenjo-Daro, Bamiyan, Borobudur and Basra in the 1970s, I'm going to suggest that the stakes have changed. From the idealistic solidarities and, of course, quasi-colonial European interventions into heritage protection in developing nations to the juggernaut that we have now of 981 sites in 160 countries with million-dollar nomination dossiers and the promise of vast tourist revenues, world heritage status, both attaining and keeping it, is of global import. World heritage in the service of intercultural understanding and peace building, synonymous with the invention of UNESCO, is slowly being eclipsed by politico-economic leverage and advantage on a global stage. This year, in Cambodia, during the World Heritage Committee meetings, we were presented with a number of conservation crises. The State of Conservation reports revealed uh, effluent in South Africa's Sturkfontein Caves, concrete reconstructions in Abu Mina, Egypt, collapsed bridges, demolished markets, and harassed communities in Hampi, India, and the flooding of sites in China. Ikemos expressed concern over the destruction of the bazaar and the collapsed bridge at Hampi, some of which you see here, and recommended sending a reactive monitoring mission. Several committee members argued that there was no need to send an independent mission to assess the state of conservation. Instead, they suggested that a local UNESCO office in India liaise with the state party. Given this seeming conflict of interest, the delegate from Senegal, one of the only archaeologists on the World Heritage Committee um, 21 body uh, group, responded that an independent monitoring mission was needed for proper assessment. Russia, South Africa, Malaysia, Qatar, Iraq, Ethiopia, Algeria, and UAE backed India, and the matter of the mission was quashed. Now, voting blocks like these tend to shut down discussion of substantive conservation issues and simply side with one nation or another. These alliances soon become highly predictable, and after attending one or two of the meetings, you can tell exactly what's going to happen. Many delegations and representatives from ICOMOS and the IUCN have recently expressed concern about the lack of informed debate. Blocks can be forged on continental, religion, uh, regional, economic, or even former colonial relationships. Political pacting like this not only serves to ensure inscription for the committee's own national sites, but prevents threatened sites from being transferred to the list of world heritage in danger. One bloc that has secured voting power is the formidable geopolitical alliance known as BRICS, a politico-economic coalition formed between Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The acronym BRICS was coined at Goldman Sachs for those nations at a similar stage of newly advanced economic development, 
and the subsequent shift in global economic power away from the older style G8 countries. Brazil, China and South Africa served on the 2011 World Heritage Committee in Russia and Russia, India and South Africa in 2012 and 2013. So that group has been on the committee making decisions for the last few years. And I, as I've suggested throughout these meetings, national agendas often eclipse substantive discussion of the merits of site nominations, the attendant issues of community benefits, the participation of indigenous stakeholders, or threats from mining and development. With the growing dominance of strategic political alliances within this committee of 21 states, the recommendations of ICOMOS and to a lesser degree the IUCN have increasingly been overturned and publicly derided. In an unprecedented move, the Director General appealed to the committee. She said, and I quote, we can continue to gather year after year as accountants of the World Heritage label, adding more and more sites to the list, adhering less and less to its criteria. Or we can choose another path. We can decide to act and think as visionaries, to rejuvenate the World Heritage Convention and confront the challenges of the 21st century. World heritage is not a beauty contest." Unquote. Back in 2010, an external auditor was tasked with assessing UNESCO's priority initiative, the Global Strategy for a Credible, Representative and Balanced World Heritage List. The audit revealed then that the committee's decisions were increasingly diverging from the scientific opinions of the advisory bodies, resulting in a more political rather than heritage approach to the convention. Sufficient representation is not being given to heritage experts within national delegations, and these are now largely political appointments. Significantly, there is a correlation between the countries represented on the committee and the location of properties inscribed on the list. From 1977 to 2005, in 314 nominations, 42% benefited those with countries that had committee members during their mandate. And this is striking when one considers that the 21 committee members comprise only 11% of the total signatories. The audit also revealed that conservation monitoring is under increased pressure and that the effects of climate change, anthropogenic pressures and poor protection and management are negatively impacting many, many sites. Moreover, UNESCO's funding for monitoring almost 1,000 properties is insufficient and financial support for conservation is largely derived from extra budgetary sources. With almost universal membership of the convention, the World Heritage Fund has reached its peak, and so compulsory contributions to it will now remain stable. At the current level of US $5.2 million for 2012 and 13, there is justifiable concern that the commitment to conserving properties already on the list will not be met. The strategy behind the list of World Heritage in Danger as a tool for conservation and the mobilization of international assistance is also failing. And it is to that list that I now turn. So on June 19th this year uh, at the committee meetings in Cambodia, there was discussion to, of, about the threat to the historic district of Panama from the construction of the Sinta Costera Maritime Highway, and it was debated as it has been for the past six years, consuming countless hours of committee time. The third phase of the Maritime Highway will be completed next year. For the state and the developer alike, the project was, and I quote, designed to encourage coastal development and add value, unquote. Moreover, retaining UNESCO designation is actually part of the overall strategy since many investors have poured money in hoping that they will elevate uh, values of the properties in the area by having UNESCO listing. The archaeological site of Panama Vejo is also threatened, but there was hardly any discussion of this site. So this is the viaduct, as you see, surrounding the historic uh, district of Panama. Sinta Costera is being constructed by the Brazilian company Norberto Odebrecht, who have government contracts worth 3.5 billion US dollars. A coalition of 11 civic groups representing more than 35,000 Panamanians have demanded that the government and Nor Norberto Odebrecht hold the, hold the construction of its 782 million six-lane coastal highway 
They believe it is illegal, it is overly expensive, and would cause irreparable harm to Casco Veo, the historic area. And this information is all widely available online. In theory, Panama could accept that the infrastructural development has endangered the site, as Germany did with the Elbe Valley World Heritage Site in 2006, and then when it was officially delisted in 2009. But instead of salvaging sites or shoring up ancient buildings, the convention is being used to prop up state projects, mining, logging, and construction, indeed, to prop up state ambitions. In February 2013, the Panamanian government produced its own state of conservation report. No mention is made of the Sintra Costera project in this 72-page dossier. The problem of the highway is neatly transposed into the problem of the historic district, thus directing attention and blame towards the living inhabitants of Casco Antigua, many of whom are exceedingly poor. The report recounts the conservation challenges of living in a 17th century colonial town, including renovation to stabilize buildings and perimeter walls, paved streets, provide storm drainage, and underground utilities for electricity and sewerage. A total of 30 pages are given over to photographs of dilapidated buildings. The report then recasts any possible endangered listing as the issue of the historic district itself, rather than this viaduct that we see here, and also to assign blame to the inhabitants of that district and to signal that poverty and the old ways must be replaced by new infrastructures and new capitalisms. UNESCO's original draft in 2013 was to inscribe the property on the list of world heritage in danger, but this was met with fierce resistance. In a remarkable turn of events, which were live streamed to the world, and some of you may have been watching, the South African delegate pointed to the 16th century buildings, uh, saying, and I quote, there are already unsightly villages or whatever around the site itself. And for me, I think it improves. I think the viaduct improves the view and sort of cordons off the unsightliness and packages the site much better than what it was from what I can see. She continued and in agreement with India and Qatar, she asserted, from this bridge itself, you now have a better viewing point of the site, which you didn't have before. This actually does enhance the heritage site rather than hinders it, unquote. India had previously argued that the viaduct added to the property rather like uh, the Golden Gate or the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So the viaduct does not detract from the value of the historic site, instead it adds value. It cordons off the unsightliness of history. And in this astonishing turn of events, the highway becomes world heritage and it improves it as a modern installation in contrast to this poorly maintained historic district from the 1600s. Perhaps not surprisingly, the committee decided not to inscribe Old Panama on the World Heritage in Danger list. Instead, there has to be a significant boundary modification, another reactive monitoring mission will be sent, and if the state party did not implement the committee's requests, the property may be removed from the World Heritage List, but only in 2015. Panama thanked their colleagues from India, Russia, and Brazil for their ongoing assistance, which I would suggest is another indication of the influence of the BRICS alliance. Tim Badman, who is the uh, head of the World Heritage Program at the IUCN, identified an emerging trend at this year's meetings. Uh, this is a good example. To accommodate planned or ongo ongoing industrial extraction activities and infrastructural development, rather than protecting existing World Heritage sites, and that should be the Convention's highest priority. These external threats are far more mundane and also potentially retractable and must be given explicit recognition by the committee and the state parties. As I outline here, there are clearly new challenges being mounted by state parties and that is to some degree directed at the particular constitution of the committee. But I also want to reiterate that one of the most significant face, uh, issues facing UNESCO for the conservation of world heritage right now is to remedy the financial crisis that the organization now faces after the withdrawal, the financial withdrawal of the United States. Regardless of these changed economic circumstances, the nomination of new sites continues 
and there are obviously concerns for the protection of those already on the list. For the past few years, uh, there have been two thematic side meetings uh, at the World Heritage uh, Committee meetings. One is on the operational guidelines, the other on the budget, and they're held during lunchtime and everybody's encouraged to go. The operational guidelines meetings are very well attended by members of the committee, also the BRICS representatives and also the G20 nations are all there and they, they can all voice their concerns. So nations want to ensure that they can nominate at least two sites per year, that there would not be an annual cap of 30 nominations to the list, even in the face of these dwindling resources. Now the budget meeting, which I show you here, uh, is often rather poorly attended, uh, largely by uh, representatives from Australia, Switzerland, Estonia, the UK and the US. And the issues discussed there really have far greater magnitude. The questions are, how might the World Heritage Committee run, how can the centre run on a 22% budgetary reduction? How would site assessments, much less international assistance and conservation missions be funded? How could the overall annual contribution be raised? There are many countries that give less than $100, for example. There are ongoing concerns for UNESCO and World Heritage, that, and there do not seem to be very easy solutions at hand. So I want to turn from this rather grim picture, um, and I think it is the broader global setting that we face, uh, to a very site-specific context now, um, where archaeological research and conservation have been fully integrated from the outset of the project. And while I'm not suggesting that this site has all the answers by far, it is an example of what can happen when conservation communities and research are all considered integral. So Chattel Hayuk is a Neolithic settlement in central Turkey and it is newly inscribed uh, on the World Heritage List. The site is directed by Professor Ian Hodder and what the site is known for in our discipline is the integration of sciences and social sciences within archaeology, a strong commitment to conservation and site presentation and to local community involvement. Inscribed uh, in 2012 on the basis of criteria three and four, which is, I quote, a rare example of a well-preserved Neolithic settlement that has been considered one of the key sites for understanding human prehistory. The site is exceptional for its substantial size and great longevity of the settlement, its distinctive layout of back-to-back -back houses with roof access, the presence of a large uh, assemblage of features, including wall paintings, reliefs, representing the symbolic world of its inhabitants, unquote. It's also possibly rare on the list as a working archaeological excavation that has a planned 25-year lifespan which started in 1994 and it has run every summer since. You can see here two main excavation areas, both covered with massive shelters in the south and the north. And here conservation and excavation go hand in hand from the start of the project. And we've had international teams working with archaeologists in the trenches. There's also extensive uh, object conservation, obviously, working between conservators, excavators, and lab specialists, including people working on human remains, faunal analysts, and those working on figurines, pigments, lithics, and so on. Of course, the methodologies have changed over this 20-year period, and much experimental work has been done, whether by experts from the University of Pennsylvania or University College London, and we, of course, have a massive challenge with the plasters, especially the painted plasters from the site. And this is a very old challenge going back to the 1960s when plasters were saturated with chemicals, overpainted in many cases, cut and lifted. They cannot be accessed or studied in any detail and sadly are of little use to researchers. In our own project's history, we've gone from using chemicals to consolidate cracks in the plaster that have left gray, dark gray streaks over time. And we're now trying other, perhaps more basic, um, using more basic materials and techniques, some of which include using our own spoil heap to get materials close to the original mud brick that we work with. Suffice to say, there's been already almost 20 years of um, experimentation. We think now that the best solution and one that is sustainable is training local people who still employ plastering techniques today to regularly maintain their walls. 
Since our project will end in a matter of years, we need to find a sustainable solution, and this also means that the neighbouring villages will take responsibility and a long-term interest in the conservation of the site. Ideally, this can also happen throughout the excavation to make the project more integrated. This is ongoing work spearheaded by uh, Ashley Lingle and Chris Clear. And I'd say that there are, of course, some challenges in central Turkey involving gender and employment. But the project has had some success in training and employing women and is committed to that policy. We've also in identified issues with our new shelters, although they have won design awards um, and uh, you know, it's obviously very impressive architecture, but they are also intended to protect and represent the excavations for the public, and of course to be environmentally stable with our intense summer heat and then winter snows in this part of Turkey. What we've also discovered through our many seasons is that the best plastered features and wall paintings often occur in burned buildings, uh, like those that you will see here. And there are enormous challenges for preserving the burned Bucrania, the, the bull's horns, the plastered bull's heads, benches, platforms, and so on. And we've learned that employing 3D scanning can also be a valuable integrative tool for conservation. And in the case of Building 77, we rely heavily on the scanned record of the installations because some only survive for a very short time due to their burn state. Çatalhöyük has one of the most extensive uses of digital recording of any archaeological site, and we use these techniques analytically, not simply for visualization. In this site, we can see how it can be used for conservation monitoring. On the top image, we have a scan of the painted plaster in Building 80, taken two years ago and linked um, with GIS to the site record. In the second, we can see the underlying geometry of the wall, which is called a mesh. And on the third and bottom image, we can see beneath the surface. And this scan, this last scan, was taken this year. And you can see in all of those white patches, these are areas that no longer match up in location with the initial scan. So they've actually moved. And this suggests that this movement could be the result of drying or exposed walls or other activity, and that this requires future monitoring. We would never see this without the scans. Because we're fortunate enough to work with Professor Maurizio Forte and an international team from Italy, Sweden, and the US, scanning and digital methods are fully integrated throughout the project. They're used at all stages, from the use of the tablet in the trenches, to document excavation, to retrieve all the spatial data using a GIS database. And this 3D technology goes right through to the interpretation and presentation of the site to various publics. Archaeology, by its very nature, is a destructive process, and so we have a huge responsibility to excavate and record responsibly, to make our findings widely available in all formats, and also to use these new tools for monitoring, conservation, education, and future planning. So in drawing to a close, I, I want to underscore that in our experience, 20 years of the project, that for this site to have World Heritage status we need the full integration of archaeological science, the insights of social science, a strong commitment to conservation, and also to local community involvement. Today, such a position should be thought of as neither revolutionary nor a luxury, but a baseline for all projects. Like many, I am concerned about the future integrity of the World Heritage brand, and that is unfortunately how inscription, and now conservation, is being viewed. Listing has become big business, and states will not willingly relinquish that status even when they knowingly are destroying the basis for that listing. Some of that is surely national pride, but other aspects involve aggressive marketing, community cleansing, tourism, and infrastructural development. The challenge is to balance the success of the list with the burden of preserving almost a thousand sites while wrestling with the unyielding economic and political imp imperatives of state parties. From what we have witnessed in recent years, this last issue may prove the greatest challenge. Since UNESCO is well-schooled in the arenas of conflict and diplomacy, perhaps they can indeed change the minds of men. Thank you very much. <laughs>